here to defend comic liberty, one of the most important liberties. And when the Satanic Verses was published, people said they burnt it because it was disrespectful. They said it was, if it was a respectful sort of discussion, they wouldn't have burnt it. So the burning of the Satanic Verses by Muslim fundamentalists in Bradford caused outrage among liberal writers and intellectuals. And when the fatwa was pronounced a few months later and Rushdie had to go into hiding, people stood up to defend him. Some read for him, people spoke for him, but they didn't stand in the street for him. Who in their right minds would confront the mobs that went out on the streets demanding his death? No one, no one that is except about 40 women who stood in Parliament Square in May 1989 as 20,000 angry men marched past. The men were demanding a blasphemy law holding Khomeini and King Fahd flags, posters, and brandishing images of Rushdie being hanged. We, that's Pragna and I, uh, um, uh, were among the women in the square. And we adopted a famous anti-racist slogan to say, here to doubt, here to stay, religious leaders won't have their way. But I want to stop for a moment and think about the strangeness of that time. Because instinctively, I knew it was a fundamentalist uprising. I made a film about it called Hadabalu over Satanic Verses, which is in, um, uh, on YouTube. But if you, if you want, really want to just depress yourself, watch that. Because you know, everything we've said today was said then in 1989. And the, so we knew these were fundamentalists on the march. But there was a professor called Tariq Modud who wrote a piece saying, that this anti-Rushdie sentiment couldn't be fundamentalist because the Wahhabis have no particular attachment to the person of the Prophet. You know, that is more in the realm of other forms of Islam, traditional Islam, the Barelvis, Sufi forms, and so on. So the peaceful Barelvi set that is the dominant strand of British Islam who are much more passionate about the person of their Prophet. And th this worried me because I knew that to be true and I, I couldn't quite match these things up. Uh, the Wahhabis, in fact, are so indifferent, so reckless to the feelings of believers that they have destroyed many of the great historic sites of the city of Mecca. They've, they've, uh, the guardians of Islam have taken a wrecking ball to its history and its holy places, including Muhammad's birthplace. I don't know about you, but I feel wounded about that. I feel wounded about the destruction of the history of Muslims. And I find it hard to imagine a great religion whose people are so utterly indifferent to the destruction of their holy places that there's been barely a protest about it. And even those going to Hajj report that finding their private prayers being disrupted by the religious police. You can think of no greater attack on religious freedom than standing in the holy place of Mecca and not being allowed to pray as you choose in the birthplace or the tomb of, of, of your prophet. But so everyone will have their own narratives about the growth of fundamentalist movements in their region and the ways in which they venerate terror and shut down free speech. And I come from India, and I don't want us to ever forget that the descendants of the party that killed Gandhi are in power today in India. They venerate Godse, his assassin, threatening to build temples to him and call Gandhi the terrorist. They have relentlessly attacked artists and writers, M.F. Hussain, was driven out of India because he, he painted naked goddesses, which after all is fundamental to many forms of Hinduism. And uh, Parugam, a Tamil writer in his prime, has just recently announced his death as a novelist because he's been forced to withdraw his writings. Fundamentalist terror movements are not specific to any religion. But my story, that's the story of the lineage of what happened to the cartoonists and writers and artists and of Charlie Hebdo and the Jews that were killed in the supermarket, that lineage and its connections with the Rushdie affair starts with Pakistan. Most accounts uh, of the foundation of Pakistan are based on the idea that it started as a liberal Muslim homeland. That was Jinnah's vision of Pakistan, one of equal citizenship once he'd carved out his separate state. 
But recent research shows that there were other more popular imagining of, imaginings of Pakistan, uh, written mostly in Urdu, uh, which showed it as, which saw it and conceived it as the perfect Islamic state. The people who signed up to this and mobilized for it were not initially the austere fundamentalists of the Jamaat-e Islami who opposed the foundation of Pakistan, but many of the peers of the Sufi orders. And it's their descendants, I think, much later, according to Professor Chetan Bhatt, who said they were among the first to sign up to Al-Qaeda's early declaration of war against Jews and Crusaders. So, but the Jamaat-e Islami very quickly reconciled itself to the defense of Pakistan and sought to Islamicize it by attacking Ahmadiyyas, killing trade unionists, and creating mayhem in universities. Work that they continue to this day. Rashid Rahman, a great civil rights lawyer in Pakistan, was killed only last year after he defended the case of a man jailed for blasphemy, Junaid Hafiz, simply because the Jamaat-e Islami was bent on taking over uh, the, his department at his university. So most accounts of Islamicization, and this is from whichever end of the political spectrum you're talking about, when they talk about what happened in Pakistan, start the process of Islamicization in the 70s when the dictator Zia ul Haq was in power. This is pretty much universal. But I really want to say to this audience, you have to think harder than that. Uh, you know, there were, was a foundational push for an Islamic state at the foundation of Pakistan. And by the time Zia ul Haq came to power, Key, the, and and in, it was in his time that key elements of programs, uh, the, the pushing of Sharia law, uh, the, the, the Hadood ordinances, the making of zina uh, a crime punishable by death, making blasphemy a crime punishable by death, and so on, these indeed came in the 70s. But they came after Pakistan had been decisively defeated in a genocidal war which led to the birth of Bangladesh. So that war was a jihad, and the Jamaat-e Islami were key partners of the, uh, uh, of the army of Pakistan. They gave it its ideological ballast, they had death squads, they uh, picked up people, they had local knowledge because the Pakistanis came from uh, a thousand miles away, they were Punjabis and others, they were ethnically different, they were religiously the same. Uh, but they didn't speak the same language and so on. Their local partners were the local fundamentalists who helped them uh, commit mass murder. Um, and then as now, they served Western interests by acting as the gatekeepers and leaders in the containment of communism. And now they still act along with the government while fighting it at the same time uh, on the containment of jihadis, because who better to do this than a transnational fundamentalist organization? And they continue to this day to spread their own message of hate towards minorities, uh, pushing for blasphemy or defamation laws, and Islamicizing the state with dis discriminatory laws. So last year, more than 40 years after the event, after a huge mass movement for justice in, in Bangladesh, which has pretty much been ignored in the world's media, two men were convicted uh, one in Britain, one in America, of war crimes. Um, Moinuddin, one of the men convicted in Britain who I investigated years ago, had risen to prominence as one of the organizers of the Satanic Versus campaign, and, and he'd called for the uh, new blasphemy law in Britain. And his role in the Jamaat-e Islami death squad al-Badr had been rumored since 71 among Bangladeshi communities in Britain, but that didn't harm him or his bosses like Iqbal Sakrani. It was the route to Iqbal Sakrani's knighthood and Moinuddin's friendship with Prince Charles. Moinuddin was to become, as I said, a leader of the anti-Rushdi campaign. And many accounts of the origins of the Rushdi affair mentioned India and the alienation of Indian Muslims. One popular book borrowed from, uh, uh, from Edward Said's writing on uh, Orientalism uh, described a, a sort of, per, by Rana Kabani, I mean, older people might remember it, described a sort of permanent history of opposition between the Christian West and Islam. But we were all looking, both those who were pro and those who were anti-Rushdi in the wrong direction. We needed to look towards Pakistan, the incubator of much of the anti-Rushdi campaigning and foundational for the British Jihad that followed. One of the key actors 
in Pakistan was the ISI, the intelligence services. And we look at that political moment. What had happened in 89? Was there this massive division between the West and Islam, or rather the West and Muslim fundamentalists? No. This was the period when the Soviet Union was being destroyed, the jihad in Afghanistan had succeeded, and Pakistan was awash with American money and uh, uh, jihadi outfits that it had funded and backed, uh, as well as the Arab outfits that, were, that had found a home there, as well as in Afghanistan. And they were flexing their muscles. I believe now that they were flexing their muscles with the success of their Islamicization campaigns, the domestic Islamicization campaign, and their foreign jihad in Afghanistan, and their ongoing jihad, which is absolutely foundational to Pakistan, of the, jihad, the Kashmir jihad. Um, the, it, all those things came together and, and, and made them push uh, uh, on, on the Rushdie issue. And there were many different local factors in, in which, which uh, occurred. But the Pakistani factor, I believe, is absolutely one of the keys. Hussein Haqqani, who was a former ambassador to Pakistan, who had links in his youth with fundamentalist organizations, says that marked copies of the satanic verses were sent to fundamentalist protesters in Pakistan. And uh, we now uh, know that the Tablighi Jamaat, another fundamentalist outfit, had lots of officers who uh, had gone into the army and so on. It's a huge Indian outfit as well. They organized massive um, information spreading about the satanic verses. So the forces that destabilized Pakistan then, where there was a woman prime minister as well, uh, they didn't succeed in getting rid of her then, but they, they certainly helped to destabilize Pakistan. Years later, they succeeded as she predicted, in assassinating her. But at that time, they simply caused mayhem. The protesters went out on the street. They attacked, I think, uh, the American consulate. And they got shot by armed police and became the cause, the apparent cause, I should say, of a fatwa written by Khomeini. Because, of course, the story of the fatwa is not simply an Iranian one. As Kenan Malik says in his book, Satanic Verses had actually been published in, Pakistan, in, uh, in Iran. British Muslims had gone to Tehran to get Khomeini to intervene. One of them, Giasuddin Siddiqui, who renounced his fundamentalist views and made a significant statement when I held a three-way conversation with him and Asif Munir, one of Moinuddin's victims. The victi his father had been killed by the death squad um, run by Prince Charles's friend. And Siddiqui finally solved this puzzle of what were the Wahhabi is doing, and the Deobandis and so on, who are supposed not to care about what the Prophet's birthplace and his holy sites and so on, what were they doing? Um, you know, was it them? Was it the Berelvis? What was the Rushdie campaign really about? And he confirmed that he'd been a member of the Jamaat the the, the, the the student wing, the very violent student wing of the Jamaat, and where he'd learned the practice of violence. And that the anti-Rushdi campaign was an alliance, but also a jockeying for, jockeying for power between the fundamentalists backed by Iran and the fundamentalists backed by Saudi Arabia. But most of all, it was a cynical mobilization by the Pakistani and Bangladeshi Jamaat of the Barelvis and the Sufis and so on, the so, 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 supposed moderates. So Professor Modud was right. It was the Barelvi Muslims and many others whose relatives had been killed by the Jamaat in Bangladesh who were mobilized to defend their profit. Um, uh, but he was wrong in that it was the fundamentalists who mobilized them. Now, I, I want to turn to something else, because we often say that Muslims are the first people to be targeted by the fundamentalists. Well, that's almost true, but it's not quite true. Because the first people to be targeted by fundamentalists are, of course, those who are deemed non-Muslims. Now, there may be people who consider themselves Muslims, and the fundamentalists don't consider them Muslims. But the ones who clearly are not Muslims, the pagans, the unbelievers, the kufr, the ones who are never Muslims, who have, who have no, who are not people of the book, are in one of the first lines of attack. And therefore, in the 70s in Bangladesh, it was Hindus who were massacred in vast numbers in Bangladesh. Many people across the board were massacred, either for their religious identity or their politics or both. But Hindus were in the first line of attack, as the Yazidis have been with ISIS. And I suspect that one of the reasons the ISIS chose the Yazidis in this very public attack is that in my visits to 
Iraq and um, the, the northern part, the Kurdish parts, the, the, the Kurdish region, a lot of Iraqis and Kurds told me that the Yazidis are seen as an outsider group, a despised group of mysterious views, uh, worshiping the devil, um, and, and, and they are pagans, you know. So they, they belong to an ancient, pre-monotheistic religion, and they are in the first line of attack. Um, but the use of the fatwa to declare people kufr or murtad is absolutely crucial to that. So Pakistan, in, during the Bangladesh war, banned, well, or earlier, before it had started, banned the Bengali language, banned the poet Tagore, and tortured and murdered literary people simply because of their love of Tagore and Bengali literature. They also, and, and um, one of the ways in which they were targeted, I mean, a lot of these people were Muslim freethinkers, um, uh, but they were seen as proto-Hindus and uh, not proper Muslims because they had a common culture, a Bengali culture, for which they were fighting. So we're told that offensive speech leads to genocide. Um, and it leads to the closing down of thought, of laughter, love, and so on. It's a warning sign of things to come. But it isn't just the speech that leads to genocide. It's, 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 it, it, isn't, it isn't the offensive speech, it's the incitement of this kind of labeling that, that puts a target on your back. I want to, I, I have to wind up very fast, but I want to speed forward and talk about another favorite Pakistani jihadi outfit, and that's lashkar e toiba which was an, a, a Pakistani uh, intelligence-backed outfit uh, that uh, is focused on Kashmir. And uh, lashkar e toiba was behind the Mumbai attacks, the Bombay, the attacks on Bombay uh, that covered uh, ordinary people who are commuters in the train station, the global elite in the Taj Hotel, and a Jewish center. It was a very deliberately planned, and it was the first of the military-style attacks, a new style of attack that struck uh, terror into the heart of the, the Americans. But of course, they didn't realize that what was, what, what, uh, or, or purported not to, that one of their own agents, David Headley, had been both a Pakistani agent and an American agent and had plotted that attack. And why, when was David Headley picked up? He was picked up in the plot to uh, launch an attack on Newlands Poston. Those were his two jobs. One was Bombay, the other was Newlands Poston. And David Headley was at the center of both. But I don't want to end on too bad a note I want to say, in 1989, there were 40 of us. In France, there were nearly 4 million. That's the difference. Let's build on it. <laughs>